Hello, everybody. Hope you're having a good weekend. All right. So this video is going to be dealing with the topic of original sin. Now, this is a bit of a contentious issue for some people, but uh, I ask you to just listen through it, and we're just going to take it uh, one step at a time and just maybe look into it with a little bit more detail than usual and uh, we'll see where it goes now original sin is a Roman Catholic doctrine or as well as Protestant many Protestants also hold it as a doctrine but it, it actually came um, it actually is a part of the Roman Catholic doctrine. It's just not one of the contested doctrines, uh, or one of the. It's not one of the usually contested doctrines. Okay, um, so I got this book. I found it at the dollar store for a dollar. At the thrift store, and this is. Uh, Canons and Decrees of the Council of Trent. So what is the Council of Trent? The Council of Trent is basically Roman Catholic law. Okay, so how does that work? Well, in the 16th century, when Protestantism started, the, um, the Roman Catholics didn't really have all of their beliefs laid out per se. Um, in one book they uh, had their teachings and the priests were taught in the seminaries but um, the, the generally the people were not taught um, a whole lot about the Bible they were taught the seven sacraments so the, the Roman Catholic Church has made the a program to follow that if you followed this program you're through your life you would be okay with God and this was the way things worked and that the church was basically just entrusted with you know you do what God wants us to do and and we'll just follow along with it that was the basic attitude and um, the uh, so they had the seven sacraments and and you just went to church and did what they said basically and the, the church held a lot of power they even crowned kings uh, like a king couldn't get away with being crowned without the pope crowning him or endorsing that crowning in europe so um, now when the protestants started to protest certain teachings or certain practices um, it started out with a few simple ones and then got expanded into more and more things that they were contesting as they were researching and um, uh, finally Europe start became, became very divided between Protestants and Catholics and the church uh, was refusing to amend any of its teachings and what they did was they ended up having an ecumenical council and that is a, a very important thing for the church it's uh, you know the first the first ecumenical council that they teach is when when Paul and the Apostles met in Jerusalem it's in, recorded in the book of Acts and then I think the uh, second was the Nicene Creed so these are defined the church's beliefs so the council of trent was basically a council that was held to answer all of the circulating teachings that the protestants were bringing up and to give an answer to all of them and it literally took 10 years to do it to make this book and this book is all the all the decrees that this council came up with defining the teachings of the Catholic Church and
from this time on, this was law. It, was, it wasn't just church law. It was the law of the land in Europe for Roman, any Roman Catholic dominion. You could be charged under this law. And people were tortured. They were burned at the stake. And that was a, a, a common punishment of the time. Uh, Protestants would also do that to people uh, when they were in power. So um, those were the times. But this is the, the Roman Catholic law, uh, is what I'm getting at. That's what this is. Now, this here copy was published in 1978 by a, a man named Reverend H.J. Schroeder, O.P. I'm not sure what O.P. means. Um, and uh, it says a note in the beginning, Note, the original 1941 edition contained the Latin text and the English translation. This edition contains only the English translation because few can read Latin anymore. Plus, this issue is aimed at a wider readership. Okay, so it's, uh, it's basically was written in 1941, and this is the reprint of it in 78 without the Latin. And it also has this, which is important to Catholic people. And at the beginning page of a book, you'll see this here. I need to get in, get around this camera here. You see it says Neil Abstat. That's Latin. I don't know exactly what that is. I can't remember what it means. And there's also down here, Impromater. That uh, is signed off by bishops or by the uh, authorities in the church as something representative of the church. If it doesn't have those things in it, then um, as my mother, like I don't know a lot about that, but as my mother explained to me, who was a Roman Catholic, that um, that that is basically the church endorsement of the book. And if it doesn't have that, then it, uh, it doesn't represent the Roman Catholic beliefs. Or as she put it, you shouldn't even read it. Okay, now, so I wanted to, I'm, I'm presenting this book because I want to uh, present from this book the Roman Catholic beliefs on original sin. And uh, like I said before, it, it is a Roman Catholic doctrine and it's um, held by I would say the majority of the Protestant churches. So it's not a protested belief per se. It would be uh, very rarely, I suppose. So let's get into what it is. I'll just read it to you. That decree concern, this is celebrated on the seventh day of June, 1546, the fifth session of the Council of Trent. Decree Concerning Original Sin That our Catholic faith, without which it is impossible to please God. And then they reference here. Now, I don't think, like these references at the scriptural, scriptural references as footnotes. Okay, now these scriptural references are not in the original Council of Trent. Um, they do reference things right in the text, but um, I don't think they had those footnotes that that was added to give more authority from Scripture to support what they're saying, okay? And I find that uh, a lot of them is a little off topic, uh, but what I'm going to do is I'm going to just read it right now. And we'll look through it and just see what it says. It's only a few pages long. And then um, we're going to go through some Bible scriptures and, and, and explore the topic in the Bible a little bit, just through the scriptures. And then we'll come back to it. So we'll come back to this. And we'll look at um, 
the, uh, the scriptural references as well as the text. But right now I'll just read the text. Okay, so, that our Catholic faith, without which it is impossible to please God, may, after the destruction of errors, remain integral and spotless in its purity, and that the Christian people may not be carried about with every wind of doctrine, since that old serpent, the everlasting enemy of the human race, has among the many evils with which the Church of God is in our times disturbed, they're talking about Protestants, right? Okay, stirred up also not only new but also old dissensions concerning original sin and its remedy. The Holy Ecumenical and General Council of Trent lawfully assembled in the Holy Ghost the same three legates of the apostolic see presiding, wishing now to reclaim the erring and to strengthen the wavering, and following the testimonies of the holy scriptures, of the holy fathers, of the most approved councils, as well as the judgment and unanimity of the church herself, ordains, confesses, and declares these things concerning original sin. 1. If anyone does not confess that the first man, Adam, when he transgressed the commandment of God in paradise, immediately lost the holiness and justice in which he had been constituted, and through the offense of that prever prevarication, incurred the wrath and indignation of God, and thus death, with which God had previously threatened him. And then they reference 4, uh, Genesis 3, 1, or Genesis 2, 17. Okay. And together with the death, captivity under his power, and together with the death, captivity under his power, who thenceforth, had the empire of death, that is to say, the devil, and that the entire Adam, the entire Adam, that, that means that Adam is also a Hebrew word, it's, the, it's a, the first man was named Adam, but the word Adam means mankind in Hebrew. So they're saying all of mankind when, they, when they're saying the entire Adam, okay? That the entire Adam, through that offense of prevarication, was changed in body and soul for the worst. Let him be anathema. Anyone who does not confess this, let him be anathema. anathema. What does anatha mean? Anathema mean? Anathema means it was actually a Greek word. And in Greek, I suppose, it means an offering to some deity hung up in a temple. So it's an offering to the devil, I suppose. But in Latin, uh, anathema means um, a curse pronounced by ecclesiastical authority and accompanied by excommunication, an accursed thing. So basically it means excommunicated and cursed. Because anything not in the Catholic Church is cursed, according to their, their doctrine, all right? Okay, now, um, hence leading to burning at the stake or other things. Okay, so, now number two. If anyone asserts that the transgression of Adam injured him alone and not his posterity, and that the holiness and justice which he received from God, which he lost, he lost for himself alone and not for us also. So if anyone says that, or that he, being defiled by the sin of disobedience, has tra transfused only death and the pains of the body into the whole human race, 
so that if anyone says that it was for him alone or that it only brought death to the human race, okay, but not sin also, which is the death of the soul, let him be anathema. Since he contradicts the apostle who says, by one man sin entered into the world, and by sin death, and so death passed upon all men, in whom all have sinned. And then uh, that reference is to a scripture uh, that the footnote says, Romans 5.12. All right, so number three. If anyone asserts that this sin of Adam, which in its original, no, if anyone asserts that this sin of Adam, which in its origin is one, and by propagation, not by in imitation, transfused to, into all, which is in each one as something that is his own, so if anyone asserts that the sin of Adam, which is one, and transfused to all, which in each person is his own, okay, is taken away either by the forces of human nature or by remedy other than the merit of one mediator, our Lord Jesus Christ, who has reconciled us to God in his own blood, made unto us justin, justice, sanctification and redemption or if he denies that the merit of Jesus Christ is applied to both adults and infants by the sacrament of baptism rightly administered in the form of the church let him be anathema for there is no other name under heaven given to men whereby we must be saved whence that declaration behold the Lamb of God, behold him who takes away the sins of the world, and the other, as many of you, of you have, as have been baptized, have put on Christ. If anyone denies, oh no, okay, so, um, so that's number three finished, right? Uh, so basically it's saying anyone, um, who believes those things, let him be anathema. And then they give a few scriptures to back it up. Okay. Now, now number four. If anyone denies that infants newly born from their mother's wombs are to be baptized, even though they are born of baptized parents, or says that they are indeed baptized for the, rem for the remission of sins, but, they, but that they derive nothing of the original sin from Adam, which must be expiated by the laver of regeneration for the attainment of eternal life. So what they're saying is that babies have to be baptized for the remission of the original sin from Adam, or else they won't, they can never go to heaven, okay? And um, once it follows that in them, the form of baptism for the remission of sins is to be understood not as true, but as false. Let him be anathema. So, saying that um, if anyone says it's not right to baptize babies, let him be anathema. Okay. Now, for the apostle has said, by one man sin entered into the world, and by sin death. And so death passed upon all men in whom we all have sinned. Okay. Is this is not to be understood otherwise than as the Catholic Church has everywhere and always understood it. For in virtue of this rule of faith handed down from the apostles, even infants who could not as yet commit any sin of themselves, are for this reason truly baptized for the remission of sins in order that in them what they contracted by generation may be washed away by regeneration all right so it's to wash away generational sin 
or sins, uh, we'll talk about that later, sins from Adam or from anybody else in future, in past generations, okay? For unless a man be born again of water and the Holy Ghost, he cannot enter into the kingdom of heaven. Okay, now, number five. Almost done. If anyone denies that by the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, which is conferred in baptism, the guilt of original sin is remitted, or says that the, ho that the whole of that which belongs to the essence of sin is not taken away, but says that it is only canceled or not imputed, let him be anathema. So anyone that denies basically that the baby is completely washed of all sin when it's baptized, if anyone denies that, then let him be anathema. Okay, for in those, now it's given more reasons why this, why they say this, okay? For in those who are born again, God hates nothing. Because there is no condemnation to those who are truly buried together with Christ by baptism unto death. <coughs> who walk not according to the flesh, but putting off the old man, and putting on the new one, who is created according to God, are made innocent, immaculate, pure, guiltless, and beloved of God, heirs indeed of God, joint heirs with Christ, so that there is nothing whatever to hinder their entrance into heaven. But this holy council perceives and confesses that in the one baptized there remains concupiscence, or an or, okay, concupiscence, what is that? An inclinate, or an inclination to sin which, since it is left for us to wrestle with, cannot injure those who do, do not acquiesce, but resist manfully by the grace of Jesus Christ. Indeed, he who shall have striven lawfully shall be crowned. This concupiscence, which the apostle sometimes calls sin, the Holy Council declares the Catholic Church has never understood to be called sin in the sense that it is truly and properly sin in those born again. So he's saying, okay, in those who are born again after they're baptized, that they don't have actually sin, but they have this inclination to sin, that that's not washed away. Okay? That's the concupiscent. All right, so, but in the sense that it is of sin and inclines to sin, okay, but if anyone is of the contrary opinion, let him be anathema. The Holy Council, this Holy Council declares, however, that it is not its intention to include in this decree, which deals with original sin, the Blessed and Immaculate Virgin Mary, the Mother of God, but that the constitutions of Pope Sixtus IV of happy memory are to be observed under the penalties contained in those constitutions, which it renews. So they're saying Mary, Mary isn't included in the original sin. Okay. So that's the end of the chapter on original sin. So you sort of get the idea. Let's just review it very quickly because there's five things, okay, that they talk about, about babies. <clears throat> it's mainly got to do with infant baptism and why they baptize infants is because of original sin. So it washes away the old uh, man that was born and starts the, moon, the new man right from the beginning and then they start them on the seven sacraments from there and that's their their program that they, that they made okay now 
So if anyone does not confess that confess that Adam, when Adam sinned, he brought sin upon all of mankind. Okay, that's number one, basically. Number two, if anyone says that the sin of Adam was on him alone and not on everybody else. Okay, that's number two. And number three, if anyone says that the sin of Adam uh, was taken away by the forces of human nature or by something other than the mediator, Jesus Christ, that's number three three okay and number four if anyone denies that infants newly born from their mother's wombs are to be baptized okay for the remission or says that they are baptized for the remission of sins uh, they're saying okay it's not for the remission of sins it's for the remission of generational sins starting from Adam and possibly including others along the way okay now um, and then number five if anyone denies that by the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ which is conferred in baptism the guilt of original sin is remitted and says that the whole of that which belongs to the essence of sin is not taken away. So that they're saying, okay, anyone who says that all the sin and all the essence of sin is not taken away is anathema. And then they go on to say that there's still an inclination to sin. But that's not called sin. It's called kiss. Concupiscence. Okay. Which the apostle sometimes calls sin. And that is. Uh, they reference Romans. 6 to 8. And Colossians chapter 3. For that. So. It's funny, I find that kind of strange. If anyone denies that all of the sin, every little bit of the essence of sin, is all taken away by the infant baptism. But then they go on in the very same paragraph to say that, well, they still have an inclination to sin. Well, I don't know, that doesn't make sense to me. So... Because and then they say that inclination to sin is of sin, but not sin. So it's like the guilt of it, but not the source of it. Okay, so that takes away the guilt of it, but not the source of it. And then from then on, then the program is penance when you sin you go to confession you pay a penance of whatever is prescribed and it gets washed away and then you just do a regular penance for sins each week or as as your life goes by so that's how the roman catholic system works okay so that's that now Let's go on a little journey in the scriptures and look at uh, these issues in the scriptures. And then we'll come back and look at this again, just to reread it and, and take it apart a little bit. All right. All right. First, we'll play the devil's advocate a bit. Pardon the pun. We're going to... Um, maybe look for some arguments in the scriptures against the idea of original sin. Now, remember, we're talking about infants or babies, okay? Babies being born with sin already accounted to them. This is original sin, all right? So let's see, what is sin? First John chapter 3, verse 4, 
Whoever commits sin transgresses the law, for sin is the transgression of the law. And you know that he was manifested to take away our sins, and in him is no sin. Jesus, right? Whoever abides in him does not sin, and whoever sins has not seen him or known him. Little children, let no man deceive you. He that does righteousness is righteous, even as he is righteous. Jesus, right? He that commits sin is of the devil, for the devil sins from the beginning. For this is the purpose that the Son of God was manifested, that in that he might destroy the works of the devil. Whoever is born of God does not commit sin, for his seed remains in him, in Jesus, and he cannot sin because he is born of God. In this the children of God are manifest, and the children of the, of the devil. Whoever does not righteousness is not of the of God, neither he that loves not his brother. For this is the message that you heard from the beginning, that we should love one another, not as Cain, who was of that wicked one, and slew his brother. Why did he slew him? Because his own works were evil, and his brother's works were righteous. Okay, so... He goes right back to Cain here, Cain and Abel. They, that was the very first sin after Adam. So let's take a look here. So he's saying, okay, sin is the transgression of the law, breaking the law, okay? And who, whoever abides in Jesus does not sin because he abides in faith, right? Okay. And who do, whoever does righteousness is righteous. So righteousness, and he defines righteousness as loving your brother or loving one another and not wanting to kill somebody. You know, um, an absence of anger, envy, all those types of um, emotions. Okay, so... That's the first verse I wanted to take a look at, just to define sin a little bit. What is sin? It's, it's, it's a transgression of God's law. So it's a guilt. All right. This is again uh, with Mary and Joseph bringing the baby Jesus to, uh, to the temple to offer a sacrifice for Mary's purification after have, giving birth, there's a purification that she went through. Okay, Luke, Luke 2.23. As it is written in the law of the Lord, every male that opens the womb shall be called holy to the Lord. Alright, so there's a baby. Every firstborn male is holy. Born holy. All right. Uh, that's interesting. So he is. He cannot. He cannot be holy if he sin. If he has sin, he's born holy. Okay. So um, now this isn't talking about the special birth of Jesus. This is talking about every firstborn male. Now, where are you going to find that? You're going to find that in Exodus chapter 13. Starting verse 12. That you shall set apart unto the Lord all that open the matrix, and every firstling that comes of a beast which you have. The males shall be the Lord's, and every firstling of an ass thou shalt redeem with a lamb, and if thou wilt not redeem it, then thou shalt break his neck. 
and all the firstborn of man among your children you shall redeem. And it shall be done when your son asks you in time to come, saying, What is this? That you shall say to him, By strength of hand the Lord brought us out from Egypt, from the house of bondage, and it came to pass when Pharaoh would hardly let us go that the Lord slew all the firstborn in the land of Egypt both the firstborn of man and the firstborn of beasts. Therefore I sacrifice to the Lord all that opens the matrix, being males. But all the firstborn of my children I redeem. So uh, what does he mean by I redeem? It means he offers a lamb in, instead of the son. Okay, so um, because that firstborn male belongs to God. He is holy. So if you want to keep him, then you buy him, you redeem him by, by offering a lamb to God instead. Okay? So that's what that's about. Now, let's take a look at another verse. Matthew chapter 18. Now remember, I'm just providing some verses that related to the question, are babies born with sin? Babies are born, are they already sinners? Are they already full of sin? Okay. So now uh, Matthew chapter 18, starting in verse 1. At the same time came the disciples to Jesus, saying, Who is the greatest in the kingdom of heaven? And Jesus called a little child to him, and set him in the midst of them, and said, I, Verily I say to you, except you be converted and become as little children, you shall not enter into the kingdom of heaven. Okay? Become converted. Get baptized, repent, unless you do this and become like a little child, born again, you shall not enter the kingdom of heaven. Whoever therefore shall humble himself as this little child, the same is the greatest in the kingdom of heaven. And whoever shall receive one such little child in my name, receives me and whoever shall offend one of these little ones which believe in me it was better for him that a millstone were hanged about his neck and that he were drowned in the depth of the sea woe to the world because of offenses okay because of sin for it must needs be that offenses come sin Sin is it's necessary that sin comes, but woe to the man by whom the offense comes. So woe to the man that does it, that does that sin. Okay? We're going to get to that in a minute. Romans chapter 7, verse 7. Is the law sin? God forbid. No. I... I, I had not known sin, but by the law. For I had not known lust, except the law had said, You shall not covet. But sin, taking occasion by the commandment, wrought in me all manner of concupiscence. For without the law, sin was dead. So without law, there is no sin. Okay? For I was alive without the law once. So, but when the commandment came, sin revived and I died. So I was alive until I heard the law. And then when I heard the law, sin came up and I died. Okay? So without hearing the law, sin is dead is what he's saying here, okay? And the commandment, which was ordained to life, 
I found to be unto death. For sin taking occasion by the commandment deceived me, and by, the, by it, by the law, slew me. Because now I heard that, uh, you know, it's against the law to do this. So sin dragged me to break that law. Okay? I was tempted by it. The, wherefore, the law is holy, and the commandment is holy, and just, and good. Was then that which is good made death to me? God forbid. But sin, that it might appear sin, working death in me, by that which is good. So, so sin is using something that is good to bring death. Sin, by the commandment, might become exceeding sinful. So sin, it makes sin worse. Because sin is using something good to make something bad. For we know that the law is spiritual, but I am carnal, sold under sin. For that which I... So now he's saying, okay, now that which I do not... That which I do, I allow not. For what I would, that I do not. But what I hate, that I do. So, he's saying, okay, I am carnal. Um, I'm not able to keep the law. So, when I hear the law, I can't do it. Okay? Um, so, he's saying... Basically, okay, that a man is um, inclined against God, but he's not sinning until he actually hears, about, hears the law, and then he sins. Okay. So then he says, if then I do that which I would not, which I don't want to, I consent to the law that the law is good. So now it is no more I that do the sin, but sin that dwells in me that does it. For I know that in me, in my flesh, dwells no good thing. For to will is present with me, I want to do it, but how to perform that which is good I don't find. I don't have it. For the good that I would, I don't do. But the evil which I don't want to do, I do. Now if I do what I don't want to do, it is no more I doing it, but sin that dwells in me doing it. I find then a law that when I would do good, evil is present with me. For I delight in the law of God, after the inward man, but I see another law in my members, warring against the law of my mind, and bringing me into captivity to the law of sin. What is the law of sin? Anyone who transgresses the law of God sins. That's the law of sin. Okay? And, and he who sins shall die. So the law of sin is in my, me my members. O oh, wretched man that I am, who shall deliver me from the body of this death? See, he was perfectly happy until he heard the law. But now he's in this, this paradox of being a lawbreaker. I thank God through Jesus Christ our Lord. So then with the mind I serve the law of God, but with the flesh, the law of sin. So the flesh, the flesh does not um, benefit from salvation. The flesh is still the flesh, but the mind serves the law of God. So we'll look at Paul later, uh, the next chapter here. There is therefore, after thinking all that, 
Therefore, there is no condemnation to them which are in Jesus Christ, who walk not after the flesh, but after the Spirit. For the law of the Spirit of life in Christ Jesus has made me free from the law of sin and death. So what is the law of sin and death? The law of sin and death is he who sins shall die. He who breaks the law of God sins and he who sins shall die. That's the law of sin and death. What is the law of the spirit of life? That's the law that says, he who believes shall live. You see? So the law of the spirit of life, believing in Jesus, has made me free from the law of sin and death. For what the law could not do, in that it was weak through the flesh, okay, what the God's law could not make me keep the law, because the flesh is too weak to do it, right? God sending his own son in the likeness of sinful flesh and for sin condemns sin in the flesh that the righteousness of the law might be fulfilled in us who walk not after the flesh but after the spirit. So we don't follow and do what the flesh wants us to do we follow and do what the Spirit wants us to do. And so therefore, the, although the flesh may be condemned, the Spirit is alive. This is the Gospel, right? So now, when we talk about um, babies born in sin, well, this seems to support that. That babies, yeah, okay, the flesh, born in sin. But now, the question is here, does baptism cleanse the flesh at all? I would say probably not, because um, the inclination to sin is still there. So it doesn't cleanse the flesh. But it's the, the, it's the love of God and believing in Jesus that gives you the power over sin and over the flesh. So, how does a baby have that? How, do, how does a baby overcome the flesh? By believing in Jesus. Um, that is a good question. Um, it's not just the, the act of water washing over the body because a baby that is baptized still dies and a baby that is baptized still is in the flesh the same flesh that is inclined to sin so what was washed okay gets rid of some things that other people did things that other people did before the baby was even born okay let's take a look at that Okay, this is Deuteronomy chapter 1, okay? And the people um, were complaining. They were wandering in the desert in the Exodus, and they were complaining to God. And they said, did you bring us out here that we and our children should die in the desert? And Moses is saying to the children of Israel, he's recounting to them. In Deuteronomy, okay, he's, he's, he said, he says, Moses says, and also the Lord was angry with me for your sakes, saying, you also shall not go in to the promised land, but Joshua, the son of Nun, which stands before you, he shall go in. Encourage him, for he shall cause Israel to inherit it. Moreover, your little ones, your children, which you said should be a prey, and your children, which in that day had no knowledge between good and evil. Okay, so uh, the point here is 
Okay, here's Moses saying, Your children, which in that day had no knowledge between good and evil. So if they have no knowledge between good and evil, then how did they sin? Remember Adam and Eve, they ate the tree of knowledge of good and evil. That's their sin. The, the very first sin, they disobeyed God and they ate the no tree of knowledge between good and evil. So these children have no knowledge of good and evil. Here's Numbers chapter 14, verse 18. The Lord is long-suffering and of great mercy, forgiving iniquity and transgression, and by no means clearing the guilty, visiting the iniquity of the fathers upon the children unto the third and fourth generation. Okay, so here's the part where we talk about generational sin. So he visits the guilt of the fathers upon the children to the third and fourth generation. Um, this is a consequence of a sin goes on to four generations. So this is a part of the what they were talking about washing away not only original sin but generational sin or from four generations ago all the sin for the last four generations are on the children that are born you see so this is where they get this idea of generational sin but um, after Moses led this is during the time of Moses and it was in the Moses who first said this and it was in the in the Ten Commandments and spoken of by Moses so that in the Torah this is where this first came out in the time of Moses so now but after the um, after the time of David and Solomon when Jerusalem was uh, destined to be destroyed in 586 BC by Babylon just ahead of that time probably about 590 between 590 and 600 uh, the king of Babylon came and took a bunch of captives out of Jerusalem and Ezekiel was among those captives okay first of all let's take a look at the um, curses from Adam and Eve. Genesis chapter 3 and to Adam he said because you have hearkened unto the voice of your wife and have eaten of the tree which I commanded you saying you shall not eat of it curses the ground for your sake in sorrow you shall eat of it all the days of your life thorns and thistles it shall bring to you and you shall eat the herb of the field. In the sweat of your face you shall eat bread till you return to the ground, for out of it you were taken. For dust you are, and unto dust you shall return. So the, the ground is cursed, and death comes upon Adam. Okay, so Genesis chapter 8. This is after Noah's ark lands, and then Noah and his family are on the earth, and uh, Noah offers up a sacrifice to God. And then it says, okay, starting in verse 21, And the Lord smelled a sweet savor, and the Lord said in his heart, I will not again curse the ground any more for man's sake. For the imagination of man's heart is evil from his youth. Neither will I again smite any more every living thing as I have done. 
while the earth remains, seed time and harvest and cold and heat and summer and winter and day and night shall not cease. So there's he's, uh, he's removed the curse on the ground. Yeah, so see, he's talking about um, seed time and harvest right here, okay? Seed time and harvest. So it's no longer thorns and thistles. The curse of the ground is gone. Now it's seed time and harvest. So he used to forage for food among the thorns and thistles, picking berries. Now he's a farmer. Now he's going to have seed time, seed time and harvest. Summer and winter, day and night shall not cease. Okay. So what I'm showing here is that God, from time to time, he does change things, change the way things work. So in Noah's time here, he changed the curse of the earth. So, in Ezekiel, we'll take a look at Ezekiel. So now, in Ezekiel, we're looking, this is about 600 B.C. And God is redefining things. Right from the time that he um, determined that Jerusalem was going to be destroyed, and... The northern kingdom would be taken away and never come back. And Jerusalem would be destroyed and the Jews would be taken away. And they would come back after 70 years for David's sake. Um, ever since that time, God started to talk differently. He started to show, uh, he started to pro prophesy very heavily about the coming Messiah. And, and the, uh, the new kingdom coming, the new covenant that he spoke of through Jeremiah and other prophets. So this is one of those times where he's talking about a change. So he's saying, okay, Ezekiel chapter 18, starting in verse 1. The word of the Lord came to me again, saying, What do you mean? that you use this proverb concerning the land of Israel, saying, The fathers have eaten sour grapes, and the children's teeth are set on edge. Right? This is talking about visiting the sins of the fathers upon the children. Okay? He says, As I live, says the Lord God, you shall not have occasion any more to use this proverb in Israel. Behold, all souls are mine. As the soul of the Father, so also the soul of the Son is mine. The soul that sins, it shall die. But if a man is just, and does that which is lawful and right, and has not eaten upon the mountains, neither has lifted up his eye to the idols of the house of Israel, neither has defiled his neighbor's wife, neither has come near to a menstruous woman, and has not oppressed any, but has restored to the debtor his pledge, is spoiled none of by violence, has given his bread to the hungry, and has covered the naked with a garment, has not given forth upon interest, or taken any increase, that has withdrawn his hand from iniquity, and has executed true judgment between man and man, has walked in my statutes, and kept my judgments to deal truly, he is just, he shall surely live, says the Lord God. If he begets a son that is a robber, a shedder of blood, and that does the like to any one of these things, and that does not any of those duties, but even has eaten upon mountains, and done all the bad things, he shall not live. He has done all of these abominations. He shall surely die. His blood shall be upon him. Now, lo, if he begets a son, 
that sees all of his father's sins, which he has done, and considers and does not like that, that has not eaten upon the mountains, and not done all of these bad things, And he has executed my judgments and has walked in my statutes. He shall not die for, for the iniquity of his father. He shall surely live. As for his father, because he cruelly oppressed, spoiled his brother by violence and did what was not good among his people, he shall die in his iniquity. Yet you say, why? Does not the Son bear the iniquity of the Father, when the Son has done that which is lawful and right, and has kept all my statutes, and has done them, he shall surely live. The soul that sins, it shall die. The Son shall not bear the iniquity of the Father, neither shall the Father bear the iniquity of the Son. The righteousness of the righteous shall be upon him, and the wickedness of the wicked shall be upon him. But if the wicked will turn from his sins that he has committed and keep my statutes and do that was lawful and right, he shall surely live, he shall not die. All his transgressions that he has committed, they shall not be mentioned to him in his righteousness that he has done, he shall live. Have I any pleasure at all that the wicked should die, says the Lord God, and not that he should return from his ways and live? But when the righteous turns away from his righteousness and commits iniquity and does according to all the abominations, shall he live? All his righteousness that he has done shall not be mentioned. In his trespass that he has trespassed and in his sin that he sins, in them he shall die. Yet you say, the way of the Lord is not equal. Hear now, O house of Israel, is not my way equal? Are not your ways unequal? When a righteous man turns away from his righteousness and commits iniquity and dies in them, for his iniquity that he has done, he shall die. Again, when the wicked man turns away from his wickedness that he has committed, and does that which is lawful and right, he shall save his soul alive, because he considered and turned away from all his transgressions that he has committed, he shall surely live, he shall not die. Yet, says the house of Israel, the way of the Lord is not equal. O house of, o house of Israel, are not my ways equal? Are not your ways unequal? Therefore I will judge you, O house of Israel, Everyone, according to his ways, says the Lord God, repent and turn yourselves from all your transgressions, so iniquity shall not be your ruin. Okay, so there he goes. It's a whole chapter saying each man is responsible for his own sin. So no longer is the sin of the fathers brought upon the sins of the children, brought upon the children. If the children repent and do righteousness, then they shall live. And if the righteous start to sin, then they shall die. So, <coughs> so this is a, a whole different thing, even since Adam. And even since Noah, now he's declaring through Ezekiel this other thing. So what happens to the sins of Adam now? Uh, do the sins of Adam come upon the children? Death is upon man, mankind. Um, but death Okay, death has got a different idea now because he's saying he shall not die. You see, the, 
the one who, the righteous shall live and the sinner shall die but this is not uh, this is speaking about spiritual things like Paul was speaking about the flesh profits nothing this is uh, this is talking about the spirit so the flesh is still going to die and even if you're baptized you're still not immune from death uh, so baptism doesn't wash away death so if death comes from the original sin of Adam and baptism doesn't make you live forever like physically then death then that death is not washed away by baptism then, is it? Because in millions of baptized people die physically. But uh, the gospel says, though you die, you shall live. Meaning that there is a, an eternal life after death. So, what the um, Catholic um, teaching was talking about was that baptism washes away the death from Adam, the original sin. So in Ezekiel, that seems to throw the sins of the father's idea on its head. The things have changed since Ezekiel. And if baptism washes away the original sin of Adam which brought death then people would not be dying anymore would they let's take a look at another one one more okay this is Leviticus chapter 12 starting in verse 1 and the Lord spoke to Moses, saying, Speak to the children of Israel, saying, If a woman has conceived seed and born a man-child, then she shall be unclean seven days. According to the days of the separation of her infirmity, she shall be unclean. And in the eighth day the flesh of his foreskin shall be circumcised. And she shall then continue in the blood of her purifying 33 days, this is what Mary and Joseph uh, brought Jesus to the temple. This is the purifying that Mary went through. Okay? And she shall continue in the blood of her purifying 33 days. She shall touch no hallowed thing nor come into the sanctuary until the days of her purifying are fulfilled. But if she bears a maid child, she shall be unclean two weeks as in her separation and she shall continue in the blood of her purifying 66 days and when the days of her purifying are fulfilled for a son or a daughter she shall bring a lamb uh, of the first year for a burnt offering and a young pigeon a turtle dove for a sin offering to the door of the tabernacle of congregation of the priests who shall offer it before the Lord and make an atonement for her an atonement for her and she shall be cleansed from the issue of her blood this is the law for her that has born a male or a female and if she is not able to bring a lamb then she shall bring two turtle doves or two young pigeons one for the burnt offering and the other for a sin offering and the priest shall make an atonement for her and she shall be clean now what's missing here why is there no sin offering for the baby whether it's a male child or a female there is no atonement for the baby whatsoever so that is uh, to me that's a big big thing that you would think 
This is even before Ezekiel. This is during the time of Moses, Leviticus. Okay, so this is under the sin of Adam before it was changed under Ezekiel. There's no, there's no sin offering for the baby. And you would think that if the baby had sin that needed to be taken care of, that there would at least be an extra pigeon or something for the sin of the baby. But there isn't. Okay, so now, um, now we're going to take a look at some of Paul's writings and some of these um, scriptures that are often quoted to prove original sin. Now that we've gotten a little handle here on some of the Hebrew scriptures and a little bit of Paul's description about how sin works, let's take a look at some of these scriptures that they keep giving to us and see what if it actually applies to any of these things or not. Okay, that's the end of part one. I uh, hope you enjoyed it. Uh, we'll do part two next week where we'll uh, look at uh, Paul's teachings that churches will often point to to explain original sin and look at some of their scriptures that they uh, bring up and then we'll take a look again at the uh, Council of Trent and, and see the scriptures that it's applying and see how that all kind of fits in with what we've learned. Don't forget to like, share, and subscribe and we'll see you again next week. Thank you.